Well, the big focus on left, right and centre, the state of the economy, it's pegged actually to what we've been seeing in terms of fuel prices, diesel prices at an all-time high, petrol prices also extremely high. Uh, where, does, where does this actually fit into uh, any conversation or discussion uh, if we look at the state of the economy? Where, uh, and this is important because we're looking at a, a year plus of the GST rollout, we're looking at new GDP figures which have come out, which make a, a comparison between what we have now and 10 years of the UPA. Joining us to look at all of this, the West Bengal Finance Minister Amit Mitra, also one of the leading economists in the country. Dr. Mitra, good to speak to you. Let's start with the news peg of the day because I want to talk about five specific points uh, which would actually be very interesting for our viewers. Firstly, diesel prices and petrol prices. Now, the government says that it's out of their hands. The prices are deregulated. They, they refuse to change that. But as each day passes, can millions just watch on? Is there anything any government perhaps even your government, can do? I think, uh, Vishnu, first of all, let me say that the central government, the NDA government, has raised the petrol uh, central excise nine times since it came to office. Nine times. Let me also tell you that on February 1st, 2018, they said they will lower the, uh, the excise duty by 2%. Excellent. You know simultaneously what they did? They increased the cess by 2%. Mm. So in effect, there was no change. And the increasing the cess by 2% means that the, cent, the states would be denied that money from coming in as what, what you call devolution. So it was a two birds killed in one stone. First, no change. 2% down, 2% up, and then deny the states. Let me also tell you, which will shock your uh, viewers, that in April 2014, the central excise on petrol, for example, was 9 rupees 48 paise. Do you know what it is in July 2018? 19 rupees 48 paise. For diesel, 3 rupees 56 percent in 2000, 1st of April 2014 when this government comes to office. What is the diesel central excise today? Okay. 15.33 so percent. That means double petrol excise, double diesel. And during the time the international prices fell, the central government did not follow the market rule as you were suggesting. Yeah, in fact, in fact, the sir, states, however, held on to their bat. Yeah. Level. In fact, you, you raise an interesting point and, uh, and yesterday in Delhi what was interesting was that the, the tax component and the price of petrol was actually more than the price of petrol itself. This was in Delhi, I don't know if it was true in other states, but, but the entire structure of taxes, whatever they may be and whoever may control it, whether there can be any regulation on that or not is another issue. But my next question to you, Dr. Mitra, is this. The Petroleum Minister has said that he is in favour of including all petroleum products within GST. Obviously, the GST Council, of which you are a part, will need to, to decide on this. Is this, as a proposal, something that's acceptable to you? Well, as far as GST is concerned, petroleum has been subsumed into the GST. But we took a conscious decision with center and all state finance ministers that we will not include G petroleum into GST till GST stabilizes. Now, you'll be interested to know how unstable the GST is today. That during 2017-18, the loss to the states, which the center had to compensate, was 48,178 crores, number one. Number two, just in July, August, these last two months, the loss to the states has been 13,000 crores. That means 6,500 crores a month is what we are bleeding. Why? Because this is a completely truncated process. When you load a particular form called GST-3B, no invoices, which means there's racketeering, there is havala, because there is no way to check. So it was all supposed to be electronic. And it was self-populating, they said. Right. I told them repeatedly, as chairman of the Empowered Committee at that time, please do not launch the GST on 1st of July by force from Parliament. 
But sir, just with there, there's a and all this show show business. Doctor Mitra, there's a counterpoint to this as so well. So till the t and and yes. let me let, and yes. let, let me get your views on that. I inflation hasn't risen. Sure. There's sure. a single national market. The tax base is widening. Uh, the problems with the electronic system are getting better. Issues related to exporters are not receiving refunds. That's being looked at as well. So a lot of people would say, look, this is on its way. Whether we like it or not, we need to make it better. So there are two ways of looking at it, sir. Why do you say that it's all necessarily all bad? What the reason I'm saying that is that ask the state officers and they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, we have gone to manual paper-based evaluation. Have you heard of that? Thousands of sheets of paper the officers are having to do because the GST network has not responded the way that all of us expected to respond, provided it was not brought into play absolutely hurriedly, unpreparedly. So what we are saying is, let GST stabilize, let the compensation to states go down because their losses go down, then you can look at any other item to bring into GST which is not in GST today. So my response to the Petroleum Minister is, please come and sit at the GST Council along with the Union Finance Minister and you will know right away the consensus is let GST first stabilize instead of states bleeding right. in GST. I've given you the figures of what kind of losses. Okay, so the other figures that would be interesting to look at uh, are GDP growth. And the reason why we, we're talking about GDP growth now uh, is because of... Uh, of, of the government's own statistics which are now emerging where average GDP growth during the UPA decade was 8% but average GDP growth in this NDA regime is 7.3%. Uh, is but my question to you is this, sir. The IMF says, and I quote, the near-term macroeconomic outlook is broadly favorable. Growth is forecast to rise to 7.3% in 2018-2019 and 7.5% in 2019-22 strengthening investment and robust private consumption. So do we, that being the case, do we really need to look at into these GDP rates which aren't catastrophically different from what they were earlier on? They are catastrophically different. Why? When the, when the, UP, when the NDA government came to office, the UPA's uh, growth rate was 6.07 according to the new calculations done by the NDA government. It rose to 7.2, it rose to 8.1, excellent. And then you know what happened, came demonetization. Plummeted from 8.1% to 7.1%. Then plummeted further down to 6.7% in 2017 18. And you know what the future looks like? 2018 will be 7.3, according to several studies. And 2019-20 will be 7.5. Yes, that's Look what the IMF also says. So you're blaming, it, in, you're blaming it entirely on the you're blaming it entirely on the demonetization process. And I, I I take the point that you're mentioning. I think there are two processes. Yes. Yes. No. Also GST. All also, right. please understand GST is involved. I'll give you the alternative. Bengal's GDP in 2017-18 grew, according to the central government by 10.2 percent. India grew by 5.7 percent. Same thing in industry. India grew by 5.54 percent. Bengal grew by 16.29 percent. And I'm not saying that. Statistical CSO of the central government says that. All right. But, in but the Dr. middle Mitra, of this, Dr. Mitra, states there is... can create these problems. Okay. Yeah. Yes. But Dr. Mitra, uh, since you do point out problems with GST and with, uh, with demonetization, those who say that, look, the, here's an, a counter argument. Those who say that the UPA in the past had more robust GDP growth would also argue that that robust uh, GDP growth was because of conditions in the global economy, which were far more buoyant. And, 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 and this had a bearing on India as well. Conditions when this government came into power globally uh, were not quite the same. And therefore, and therefore, it would perhaps not have been that easy or easy enough for this government to have matched that, that GDP growth? I, I, I hear the argument, certainly. But let me submit to you, you spoke of inflation. IMF prediction for inflation this year of Consumer Price Index, and your consumers would be interested to know, is 5.2%. So you're going to get inflationary pressure. 
Now, rupee, as you know, has absolutely weakened to a point where now it's threatening possible inflationary processes, which will then lead to increase in interest rate by the RBI, and then all that follows with regard to investment demand. Let me also submit to you, foreign exchange reserves yes. have come down. Are you aware of that? Yeah, 200 and deficit 221 million dollars. To 62 yes, it's month, 62 month high for the first time. And therefore, what I'm submitting to you is that all the indicators put together, you start with the inflation, you go to foreign exchange reserves, you go to the uh, to any current account deficit. Do you know what it is? 2.8% of GDP. But sir, you again, if you were to turn all this... All these markers... If you were to turn this particular yeah. argument around, India is not responsible for surging global uh, crude prices. Yes, there is a problem with the current account of, uh, deficit, also low exports. But what would you, how would you respond to those who say that there are international factors at play and that is just a matter of time before the rupee uh, corrects itself and the larger issue of our basic economic fundamentals are still sound? I think it's very important to understand that 2008, a financial meltdown took place. Everybody knows that. India, under the government at that time, protected itself against the largest meltdown in the world. How yes. did they do it? Uh, Raghuram Rajan will tell you. The then government will tell you. So just because international conditions may turn against you in some manner, for you in some other areas, it's the maturity and wisdom of the government that produces effective policies to take the economy forward. And what I find here is knee-jerk knee -jerk reactions. You first do demonetization. Nobody knows about it. The, the economy, the growth rate of your own growth rate, which plummets. Then you do GST by force, karlenge, you know, attitude. And then you do GST, and that results in the small and medium enterprises. And of course, wipes out the demonetization, wipes out the informal sector. Employment growth plummets. Yes. Today, it is very interesting, and you'll be interested to know, ILO study says that in 2019, we will have 1.89 crores of unemployed. Why? Because you have, you have a peculiar kind of growth, which is not producing employment. Okay, Dr. Now, Mitra. Do you know that in West Bengal, the highest, lend highest bank lending in India is MSME? 44,000 right, crores, and we are now going to cooperative banks to help. Okay, now, Dr. Mitra... That creates jobs. Dr. Mitra, I want to debate a couple of these points that you're mentioning with my panel. I know you want this to be a one-on-one -on -one interview, but one final question to you before I do move on. Um, and, you know, we can debate sure. this one point sure. a lot, but let's talk a little bit about stressed sure. assets. Now, would you agree that, on the one hand, we've got a tough yes. new law, we want strong legislation in removing stressed assets, uh, we have that legislation now, but on the other hand, dozens of companies may now be forced into bankruptcy court, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the system yes. will immediately get its money back. So it seems to be you know, a, a two-sided problem. Do we have the laws? Yes, we finally do. Do we want our money back? It won't happen so, far, so soon. But is there really any reason to criticize a government which is trying to bring back all this money that's due? You know, I always appreciate governments which are trying. But in, you must know that in 2014, non-performing assets of Indian banks was 2 lakh crores. By 2018, it becomes 10.2 lakh crores. Now, you mentioned stressed assets. Stressed assets in India, unfortunately, and I am so embarrassed to say that today IMF says India is number one in the world in the worst case scenario of stressed assets of 14.7 lakh crores. 14.7 lakh crores. It, Italy apparently is, is number is two higher. with 14.4 lakh crores. Yeah. I want to know from you whether these uh, these activities that you are just you just mentioned 70 companies may go under on the 28th, which is today. Yes. Now the government has to work with Reserve Bank of India with the stakeholders. Stakeholders are, are afraid to borrow money today. Bankers are not ready to give their risk averse. All right, all right. Because so of this massive process, 
government has to lead from the front i think the bigger question at this stage dr do mitra is what exactly happened there. since as you point out that deadline is effectively over now what happens to those companies will the government actually get yes. around to taking action working with the system but uh, irrespective of that i'd like to thank you very much for joining us because we are also joined at this stage uh, by arvind dirwani uh, the exec the ex executive director of the imf and uh, the former chief uh, economic advisor thanks very much sir for being with us gorav vallabh spokesperson of the congress with me mm -hmm. and mohan goroswami chairman of the center for policy alternatives with me as well uh, mr virmani let me come to you first you heard what amit mitra had to say unfortunately he couldn't join us for this debate um the essential point that he is saying is that the economy is in a poor condition stressed assets are a problem gst is not fully worked out demonetization continues to be a problem so let's look at point number 1 gdp growth he says gdp growth is down compared to the upa because of gst and demonetization can you answer to this specific point that he mentioned well you said uh, it's unfortunate he couldn't be with us but one would need 10 minutes to he chose not to be points. he chose not to uh, be anyway, part of a debate uh, but but so, carry on sir so growth rate is down growth is down growth is down because of the problems created between 2010 and 2013 when you create a bubble when you push up the credit uh, 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 into the economy Uh, above what is a sustainable level you do not first you get a boost it happens everywhere in the world you pump up a bubble you get a boost in growth and then you get a collapse so the growth rate came down because of mistakes that were made in 2010 13 i can go into great detail on that but let me move on now the reforms did start uh, uh, pick up they started a little bit in 13 some corrective measures others were done in 14 15 and 16 there was two consecutive drought that happens once in 7 to 10 years okay. every 7 to 10 years there is a consecutive drought so uh, the recovery uh, did start in 16 17 it was true i think the demonetization story is correct to the extent that the economy would have uh, recovered much faster if not for the demonetization yes i i uh, i agree with that part of the story but the economy is now well on the way to recovery i think uh, there has been a reasonable amount done to put the fiscal deficit back under control okay and the growth is now coming back close to the sustainable level okay mr virmani i just want to go across to my other panelists as 7. well 7.5 and 8% dr gorav gorav story yeah uh, let me ask you this one of the points which was mentioned uh, is stressed assets uh, a lot of critics of this government say that you know look at this condition of stressed assets where you know billions of dollars are owed and the chances of getting that back aren't going to happen on the other hand a lot of these loans were given during the upa times there was apparently a a telephone banking culture where you picked up and loans were granted and the fallout of that back then is what we see now see how you can prove that what do you mean by a non performing asset or stressed asset a stressed that asset overdue, is when a, when overdue a company of 9 honor its loan overdue for 90 days overdue the payment is overdue for 90 no, days no but this is much more I, than i that. i'm i'm just telling that so if it is overdue in more than 90 days in the last 4 years how you can always we looking, blame we are looking Vishnu, at the how, very biggest we are uh, looking at the very biggest that, companies that's what i am saying how you can always blame the problem is that you have to tackle npa from two perspective bona fide and mala fide when bona fide right now the industrial growth is at minimum there is no industrial growth credit is not picking up the gross fixed capital formation is at lowest so how industry is going to repay that is a challenge for them so government has to accept this particular how were thing. loans given to any company in the past when the upa was in power if the upa or whoever it was at that stage the banking officials weren't convinced about the ability to repay no i am asking how come they had repaid during that and they defaulted just looking right at now? looking through some I, of I these companies 55000 now i'm not I, I, I'm asking. I'm asking one thing. I'm asking one thing, Vishnu. Yeah. 
if loan is given in 2011 or 12 or 13, they paid their dues in 12, 13, 14, and as soon as the what new government due came, diligence? So the I, process of I'm due diligence. I'm saying why? How it is going for how several it is years possible? Forward. Everyone is not mellified, Vishnu. So we are going. There at, are bona fide We are, we are growing also. at 7.3, 7.5 percent. The economy is apparently, according to you, gone down, gone down so bad I, I'm, no, that no. that these companies I'm, cannot I'm pay off a loan. I am asking you one thing because. The, the okay. fixed capital formation is not there, private investment is not there, industrial growth is coming down. That is the reason the stressed assets are uh, increasing. Okay. And I am just, I'm just responding to my small point of Dr. Virmani. He mentioned that every wrong decision, the impact is now. I am asking, how come 14, 15, 15, 16, there was a GDP upside growth trajectory? The problem is that, that there is a misadventure of this government in the form of demonetization. Another is the mismanagement okay, and sec. mistake one, of one, one moment, I want to bring it, I will come back to you. Uh, Mohan Guruswami, how would you look at this? Would you say that it's, it's, it's not enough for this government to actually blame the past, that there are fundamental problems in this economy, whether it was demonetization, GST, uh, the, the problem of stressed assets, and despite law after law which seems to have been passed, Realistic, we are realistically we are in in a crisis. I think it would be wrong to pin it on any particular government. The success and the loss <coughs> to the economy. There's been a long-term trend of of low capital formation, low investment, and it's been going on for the last 10, 12 years now. And you can see the graph; it keeps dropping, and no attempt has been made to reverse it by any of the government. Now, it accentuated during this present NDA regime, where this government came to power, pointing fingers at the previous government, saying that they've done all this and we will set it right. They didn't do anything. They didn't search. In fact, they inflicted more pain on the system. They brought in this demonetization, purposeless, no <clears throat> reason at all for it, an act of colossal stupidity. And then they hurried through with GST because of theatrics, without being prepared for it. The problem today is the system is near breakdown. Even if you want to pay, you can't pay. If you want to get refunds, you won't get it. You, there are so many things there. As a result, revenues have dropped. Now, uh, so you know, what they did was they belabored the previous government for its acts of commission and commission. And now they have even worsened things now. Haven't done anything. They just lost four years doing nothing, except abuse. You know, abuse starts the last 60 years. Okay. But I you know, you're say, working from year to year. I, I just want to know what have you done for four that years? That in last Let's four years, because the election best of the, the in a year best. Now we've Vishnu, 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 your record. Vishnu, in the last four years, the best of the best macro variables are there. I will give you yeah. that crude oil as lowest first point, which is India is having a, a big import bill in the form of the crude. Crude oil was the lowest earlier. No, in the last four years. Yes. C crude oil prices yes. at the international market is lowest. Second, international stability is there, which was not there in 2009, 10, 11, 12. You can ask any economist and all data are there. Second point, third, monsoon and the agriculture output was good. They lost the golden opportunity to take the economy into double digit growth. And now again and again blaming that this had happened because of this government. Are what you had done, why gross fixed capital Actually, formation is falling? That is, right the, that is something I am asking Vishnu. Okay, fair enough. That's why a fair it is point. falling day by day? Why inflation is growing up? Why current account deficit is going up? Why rupee dollar is crossing 70 rupee uh, mark per dollar? So you have to accept your failures and yeah. come out with the remedy that what you are going to do in life. Okay, Dr. Virmani, two specific points, two specific uh, concerns. Uh, the collapse of the rupee, all-time lows against the dollar. Yesterday, it closed at 70.16 against the dollar. The other crisis now is fuel prices, petrol prices and diesel prices. Uh, it just seems unreal for a, a, a still a largely agricultural country to have diesel prices at the rate right now is untenable for a very large part of our sector. These two issues, the rupee and fuel prices, how is this contributing to a potential crisis? So over the last eight months, uh, the rupee has appreciated to a peak. If you look at the real effective exchange rate, uh, which is what economists look at, politicians don't bother with these things, and I'm not talking about government or opposition politicians. The real effective exchange rate was at the highest level two months ago. It has now come down to a more reasonable level. 
So as far as I'm concerned, we are in a better position now than we were two months ago and over the last eight, nine months. That was a disaster for manufacturing, <laughs> for exports and for imports. Number two, on the oil, on the oil, uh, uh, it's, it's a, a long discussion. We have probably have one minute, uh, you asked me at the end. Uh, clearly, there, you know, when the oil price goes up interna internationally or down, there right. are two things which happen, both ways. When it goes up, one, obviously the current account is affected, our import price goes up. Secondly, the income, the exporters, uh, the world exporters of oil have a higher income. They tend to import more. So there is a partial offset over time. Of course, net-net, we lose when the oil prices go up. We gain when the oil prices go down. Right. But there are not just one effect on the current account. It also affects our ex imports and ex exports uh, eventually. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens after a time. You will see that in the petroleum exports uh, within three to six months. So, uh, yes, there is a problem. There are uh, basically three things the government has done. I have done it myself. You know, you're talking about somebody telling you what happened in 2008. I was a CEA. I oh. dealt with it. So if you are interested in the economics, you should ask me what was done in 2008 Okay, we'll, 2009. We'll, we'll, anyway, we'll leave that, sir. Matter. We will, we will uh, leave so, that. Yes. <laughs> We leave that, sir, for, for another day. Dr. Birmani, again, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm running short on time. One way or the other, as usual, so many questions on the state of the economy unanswered at this stage. But I'd like to thank all of our panelists very much.